Okay. Um, so I'm the um, I'm the director, medical director of community outreach and education, and really we we do appreciate your comments. So it's important that you jot down anything that you're interested in hearing about and giving them to Rachel at the end of uh, this uh, this program. A couple of things about survivorship. We can argue about the the term survivorship. The term really originated in the 1960s for people who are going through heart surgery and then rehabilitation, and so they talked about survivors. So people who had bypass were you know, put on these very rigorous uh, you know, exercise protocols, and they were called you know, cardiac rehabil rehabilitation survivors. So it's, I think it's interesting that's where the term comes from. And it really uh, didn't um, spark a lot of interest until the National Coalition of uh, Cancer Survivorship under the auspices of Ellen Stovell started to realize that more and more people were um, surviving cancer and there were a lot more issues to, um, to bring at the forefront uh, of research and, and concern. And there's a lot of issues when you're a survivor I think in 2050, uh, there will be more survivors of cancer than there will be people diagnosed with cancer. That's pretty interesting. Um, and there are a lot of issues, but we consider a survivor from the time of diagnosis. The time of diagnosis, and survivors are you know, really a, a varied group of people. They're people who are living with cancer, so you don't have to be cured of your cancer to be considered a survivor. There are people who survive a long time may get another cancer or may get a recurrence. They're, so the survivors um, are, are anyone who's had a diagnosis of cancer. You could be fighting the cancer, or you could be cured of the cancer, or you can have a recurrence of the cancer. Um, and why it's important to acknowledge uh, survivorship? Well, it's important because there's so many issues that surround survivorship. You know, people that are living longer and longer are obviously getting the problems of aging. So what are those problems? Well, the problems are uh, coronary disease, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, obesity, um, bone problems, complications from treatment, infertility, menopausal issues, uh, impotence. Um, there's a variety, bone, bone pain, uh, there's uh, depression, there's obviously a lot of psychosocial um, issues, and they're also at risk for other cancers, right? About 4% of the population are cancer survivors, about 14 million people. That's an awful lot of people. Um, and it's increasing, and we are doing a better job. Uh, we're doing a better job. The most common types of cancer, as you would think in men, are prostate, colorectal, melanoma, and in women, uterine and breast, and colorectal. Um, and the number one killer still remains is lung cancer. That's the, um, still, hasn't, hasn't changed for that, but the numbers are changing. So I'm gonna, you know, I, I'm gonna introduce our first speaker, and I'm gonna try to weave in a few interesting numbers, facts, that you may not know. Um, and there's been, you know, an, an extraordinary explosion of what survivorship means and what are the issues and new research. Do you know that a third of people who survive cancer are sedentary and don't do any exercise? I think that's pretty interesting when we talk about promoting positive behavior and health changes, right? Okay, so I'm going to first introduce, we are, um, this is our lineup, Pascal is speaking first, Pascal Buzzi. Um, so I, I know Pascal for a very long time, she's 41, and uh, when, I met, when I met Pascal, she was a mother of very young children who are, are, are growing uh, older, maybe someone's in middle school, not yet, almost, okay, we'll hear about it. Um, so Pascal was diagnosed with breast cancer um, at the age of 34, she, she throws my voice, it's fine, uh, stage four breast cancer with metastases to the bones. Um, and she had had no history of breast cancer in her family. She's married, she has uh, two sons, one's seven and one's 13, so that's middle school. Yeah. 
Um, she used to work in the social work arena, taking care of others, but since her diagnosis, she's become a PTA mom. Okay, that's important. And a volunteer for the American Cancer Society, and you probably do more work than you did when you were working outside the house, right? So Pascal's gonna come up and tell us about her story And you do know that the majority of people who get breast cancer have no identifiable risk factors. Good evening, everyone. Um, I first want to thank you for allowing me to share my story and my journey so far with all of you. I've always considered myself a hard worker, usually working both a full-time and a part-time job to make ends meet and to provide for my family. I was the one who found the lump in my left breast. And at the time, I really didn't think much of it. I had to go to my doctor for my annual physical. And kind of like as an afterthought, as I was kind of, you know, wrapping things up, I said, oh, by the way, um, I found this lump, uh, you know, like that. Um, and she told me she didn't think there was anything to worry about, but as a precaution, she advised me to get a mammogram. So I made my appointment a few weeks later and I remember being happy that the clinic was right next to my job so I could walk there and get my mammogram done during my lunch hour and then I could get back to work. I ended up being there for three hours. It was the first time I've ever had a mammogram but even I knew that wasn't really normal. They kept doing and redoing the x-rays taking more pictures, doing a sonogram. But it was not until the following week when I came to the NYU Cancer Center and had my biopsies that I was given the diagnosis. Stage four breast cancer with met met metastases to my lymph nodes and the bones in my back. Next thing I know, my team was greeting me, oncologists, surgeon, nurses, social worker. My world just kind of turned upside down. I was overwhelmed and confused. I had a six-year-old and a six-month-old waiting for me at home. I was supposed to start a new part-time job later that week. But time just seemed to stand still. I was always the one to plan my day, to plan my week, down to ironing my clothes for the next day. I felt that I didn't have time for cancer. Cancer was not part of my plan. I never thought my name and cancer would be linked in the same sentence together. I mean, there was no history of cancer in my family. I was fairly healthy, tried to go to the gym, tried to exercise when I could. I never smoked. I remember telling my friends and family about my diagnosis, and I would see the sadness and the shock on their faces. And some people couldn't really deal with it, and sometimes I ended up comforting them instead. I remember telling a friend that I was diagnosed with stage four breast cancer, and she says, well, what comes after stage four? I didn't know what to say, but I can tell you that was seven years ago. It's been a hard road full of tears and fears and at times uncertainty. My team at the cancer center decided on an aggressive course of action for me. I was put on a cocktail of Taxol, Carboplatin, and Herceptin. I was coming in for chemotherapy every week for many months. By the time I felt better, 
I had to go back in for treatment. I remember feeling guilty about not being able to take my children to the park because I felt so weak. When I got my first week off from chemotherapy, I felt ecstatic. When I got the results of my PET scans months after starting chemo and it showed that my tumors were shrinking, I was so happy that what I was going through was not in vain. It was the support and prayers of my family and friends, as well as the support of my treatment team at the cancer center that helped me get through everything. From my mom giving up her Thursdays to bring me in for treatment, to my sister or my brother watching my children so I could rest, to the positive and encouraging words from my doctors and nurses during my chemotherapy treatment, as well as during my surgeries. That's why I'm able to stand before you today. For now, I have decided to stay home and raise my kids. They are 13 and seven years old, two boys. And I am so happy that I am able to be there for them. I volunteer at both of their schools and I'm a part of both of their PTAs. I'm able to go on every trip with my seven-year-old. I am doing volunteer work at the Can American Cancer Society as a Reach to Recovery volunteer, calling up newly diagnosed women to offer them hope, support, encouragement, and friendship from someone who's been there. It's a wonderful feeling to be able to help someone even in this small way. These women are so grateful and happy for that phone call. They are happy just to be able to talk to someone who's been through it, and they derive hope from my journey. Cancer is a part of my life, but it is not my life. I don't call myself a survivor or even brave. I feel lucky and blessed for being able to still be here. There are many brave women that I've had the pleasure to meet over the years that were not as fortunate as me. I feel that I am an, uh, an individual fighting this disease each and every day, focusing on the things that matter to me the most, while thanking God for each and every glorious new day. Thank you. She, she is unbelievable, and she, she's done a lot of social work in my office, that's for sure. Thank you. Um, we, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's uh, difficult uh, when you're a patient. Um, it, you know, you, you become very vulnerable, and there are so many things that you guys could teach us about, you know, what we, what we could be doing differently. Um, the uh, Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services has made patient-doctor communication a real priority. Um, and I think it's, it's very important because there are, you know, acronyms, there are a lot of things that, you know, institutions, especially the Institution of uh, Medicine, you know, has asked us to uh, spend some time on. You know, it's not just writing prescriptions or doing surgeries, but you know, it's making a relationship between a patient fulfilling, not only for the patient, but for the doctor as well. And I think that if you have your patient's best interests, uh, you listen to them and you're thoughtful, I think you can have very fulfilling relationships with your patients and likewise. Um, I guess the one thing that has always struck me is when we, um, when, when there could be, and I'm not saying that there is, but there could be a tendency to look at a patient as, as their illness. Um, and, that, and that's a problem because the patient is not a stage four infl or an inflammatory breast cancer or stage four colon cancer or a graft failure um, or um, an aortic aneurysm that ruptured. So we've got to be cognizant of that. Um, I mean, there are so many things. There are so many things that we can talk about acknowledging a patient because we are, you know, in a position of power, right? And acknowledging a patient, thanking them for coming, um, asking if they need explanations for their prescriptions, 
you know, what's written on the label, what kind of treatment options they have, and telling them what the duration of, of uh, the wait time. You know, it's, it's interesting. I used to, and I, I always thought it was kind of funny um, that I would tell patients or my, my secretary would tell patients that maybe they should bring a canteen, worn piece, and a sleeping bag, you know, in preparing for their, you know, for their consultation with me until I realized, no, like, I'm the only one that thought it was kind of funny. But it was true that, you know, we, we kept people waiting an awful long time. Now that we're on electronic medical records, I'm, I'm one of the few doctors, I think, that really like it because it's, you know, put all the information out in front of me. And I've got a little OCD, so I've got it's got right in front of me. Well, you're an, you're a lawyer, so you probably appreciate that. You're also like a file folder, but we we can talk a little bit more about that. Uh, but again, there's so many interesting things that we can look forward to, and I really do think that medicine is changing. The Institute of Medicine um, has mandated that in 2015 we are going to have to give people their survivorship care plans and a treatment summary. So that's, that's interesting because when you finish your treatment, your doctor's going to hand you, or probably should have handed you a pathology report, but then a summary of what you've been through, and then another summary of what are the recommendations. What are the recommendations for bone density, for mammogram, for colonoscopy, you know, all sorts of things, what you can expect what we want to do is promoting uh, healthy behavior. So our next speaker um, is Julie Yip Williams. Um, Julie Yip Williams was diagnosed with stage four colon cancer in July of 2013 at the age of 37. She's married. Um, I see one daughter. Oh, I see the other two beautiful girls. You're not, and they're not even embarrassed that I mentioned them. <laughs> my kids would be like, oh. <laughs> um, she's had, um, well, her daughters are almost three and four, and when she's not currently, um, when, when she's, well, she's currently not working now, but she is a corporate lawyer by profession, um, has had two surgeries, completed a total of 16 rounds of chemotherapy, and um, I understand has, um, more, more treatments to come. So, Julie, you want to come up here? We, we probably have a few babysitters in the audience. Good evening. I was very pleased to be asked to uh, speak on this panel tonight, so thank you for having me. Cancer came into my life very suddenly. Although I have two siblings, I have a huge family on both sides. Lots of aunts, uncles, cousins. Three of my four grandparents are still living, and no one has cancer. My grandmother did die of what I believe was colon cancer, although her disease was so widespread at the time of diagnosis, it was hard for, it was, it's hard to say for sure. She was 72, not an unusual age to develop this disease. And it was all just a very long time ago. Unlike most other people who are diagnosed with colon cancer, I had no troubling symptoms until a month before my diagnosis. I was 37, much younger than the age when routine screen screenings are even recommended, which is 50. I had no blood in my stool. I didn't have any abdominal pain before that month. Within the last four years, I had delivered two healthy, beautiful girls. When I think back and try to figure out when the cancer started growing, perhaps even as early as when I was pregnant with my first child, there's nothing that makes me think I should have known that I should have done any, something differently or that my doctors should have done something differently. Um, for a year ago, I started having abdominal pain pain that I now know was caused by a large bowel obstruction, the tumor, of course. It was pain that reminded me of child labor, the way it would come and go in regular intervals for hours at a time, accompanied by a loud gargling noise like an alien had invaded my stomach. <laughs> I went to my internist quickly, Dr. Neil Lewin, 
who is affiliated with this institution and who I have the utmost faith in. Dr. Lewin thought it was probably just irritable bowel syndrome and sent me home and told me to take gas X. A couple weeks later, the pain was getting worse and I had an episode of vomiting. Dr. Lewin sent me to a gastroenterologist immediately. There was a particular urgency because I was supposed to go on vacation with my family to Los Angeles for a family wedding and reunion. The GI ran some blood tests and did an ultrasound and proclaimed that I appeared to be healthy enough to go. But if I was still having symptoms on my return, I was to have an endoscopy and colonoscopy. We went to LA, but I never made it to the wedding because I checked into an ER near my parents' house that morning. I knew something was seriously wrong when I was vomiting water. I just never thought it was cancer, Crohn's disease, some other obscure GI disease, but certainly not cancer. But it was. I was diagnosed after a colonoscopy the Sunday after the 4th of July. I felt like I'd been hit, over, run over by a truck. It just so happened that Dr. Fair, the physician covering for Dr. Lewin, called me just right after I received the diagnosis. He wanted to know how I was doing. I told him. He called Dr. Lewin immediately, whose instructions were to get out of that podunk hospital I was in and to find a colorectal surgeon in a reputable Los Angeles institution. Coming back to New York for surgery would not be an option. Within one and a half days, I was at UCLA. I had surgery quickly. By then, I looked like I was four months pregnant because the, my abdominal was so, so distended. It turned out that my colon was so, in, so obstructed, it had grown to the size of a football, and my colon was already beginning to rupture. Had it really, had it really ruptured, that would have been disastrous. I was diagnosed with stage four colon cancer because the surgeon found a single one centimeter metastasis to the peritoneum, what he believed to be a piece from the primary tumor that had literally dropped and landed on the peritoneum. For that reason, it had to be categorized as stage four, which was devastating, particularly to my husband, who's sitting right there, who is obsessed with numbers, stats, and medical studies. The five-year survival rates for stage four colon cancer are in the single digits, 10% at best. I firmly believe that cancer just makes you more of who you are. If you, it doesn't change you. If you're a pessimist, you're gonna be more of a pessimist. If you're a fighter, as I am, it will make you more of a fighter. Because of the unique circumstances of my life, I've always been a fighter. So when cancer happened to me, it felt like it was just another thing for me to battle. I was born into the poverty of post-war communist Vietnam with congenital cataracts, which meant that I was blind. I came to this country when I was three, where I received sight-giving surgeries, ironically, at UCLA. Although I have sight now, it isn't good vision. I'm considered legally blind. I can't drive, can't play tennis, and have no idea what my daughters are referring to when they point to something in the distance and say, look, mommy, I've never allowed my visual limitations to stop me from doing what I wanted to do. I've attended the best schools, have traveled all over the world, became a lawyer, got married, had children. When my husband expressed his fear of what the numbers were telling him the morning after my surgery, I asked him to give me the odds of a blind girl making it out of Vietnam, of having her sight restored, of achieving academic and professional success that no one would have dared to dream the day that she was born, of marrying some waspy boy from the South and having two healthy, beautiful girls he had to admit, next to zero. I know some cancer survivors don't like the metaphor of war that is often used when talking about dealing with cancer. 
I think it's because they don't want to think of themselves or those they love who have cancer, dying, and losing the war. For me, the language of war works. I think the war happens on two main fronts. One is the actual physical realm where surgery and chemotherapy are my most powerful weapons designed to destroy and, to, to destroy and remove cancer. The other is the psychological realm where the cancer attacks your mind and spirit, threatening to cast a shadow on your life as you'll go about living a life that is forever changed. I think that war fought in the psychological realm is the more challenging, for if you have lived with cancer, you know the darkness that can consume you. And when it isn't, it always lurks in the, on the sidelines. The fear of dying and leaving my husband and children behind the bitterness of watching everyone around you living their cancer-free lives, the anger as you ask whatever gods may be, the unanswerable question, why did this have to happen to me? The darkness that cancer brings threatens to take whatever joy there is out of life. While I can't really control much of what happens on the physical front, of this war, I can work to win on the psychological front. If I can do that, then I will call myself victorious in my war against cancer, no matter what the physical outcome. So from the outset, I have sought to find the good in all of this, to discover what cancer would teach me about myself, people, and humanity in general, how it would enrich my soul. And I try to remember what I've learned when the darkness overtakes me. Throughout my journey, I have often felt very blessed. It's a strange thing to say. We were very forthright and honest about my disease to family and friends. I was amazed by the outpouring of love and support I received. The number of floral arrangements in my hospital room set a record, I was told by the nursing staff. Family and friends I hadn't seen in 20 years came out of the woodwork. Relatives I didn't even know cared about me came to visit and tell me uh, how much they loved me. If you're familiar with Chinese culture, you'd understand how incredible and kind of weird it is to hear the words, I love you. <laughs> I was just, I, I also, um, I have also witnessed a level of human compassion that I didn't know was possible. Days after my surgery, I had a nurse aide who looked like a gangster, seriously. Slicked back, hair tied in a ponytail, muscular, very uncommunicative. But he was so gentle when, when cleaning me and lifting me and helping me do all those things that I couldn't do for myself. Then there were all the nurses who took care of me and are still taking care of me. Nurses who listen to me as I sob uncontrollably and tell me it's going to be okay, that this is not my time. Who pray for me in a language I don't understand as they grasp my hands. I've always dreamed of writing, writing my memoir to share the crazy story of my life. Cancer has given me that opportunity in the form of a blog that has been very well received. One of my blog readers from Florida, someone I've never met, after reading about my particularly harrowing 30-hour experience in the ER recently, sent me a prayer shawl that a fellow church member had crocheted and that had been blessed by her priest. She told me that when I was feeling weak and depressed to wrap the shawl around myself and remember that so many people are praying for and believe in me. I have known human compassion that has felt holy and brought tears to my eyes, and it is truly my honor and privilege. I consider myself lucky to have experienced such love, support, and compassion at my relatively young age. It is part of the human experience that many are not so fortunate to feel. I'm grateful for having the chance to think about my legacy, what it is that I want to leave behind in this world, to know that my life will have meaning, have meant something to someone other than my family and friends after my expiration date arrives, whenever that may be. 
Of course, my daughters are part of my legacy and my writing is my legacy to them. My writing, I hope, will also serve as a legacy to others. But I decided months ago that I wanted to do more. So I teamed up with the Chris for Life Colon Cancer Foundation, the second largest colon cancer organization in the country, to start a fund that will be 100% dedicated in, to what is severely underfunded research into finding a cure for the second deadliest cancer in this country. My goal is to raise $1 million in a year. I'm grateful most of all for the people I've met along this journey, people I wouldn't never have met otherwise, from my new friends in and outside the colorectal cancer community, to the people in the nonprofit world, to the extraordinary doctors who have stood by me. My colorectal surgeon at UCLA is my age, married with two little children like me. I felt like we would have all been friends in another lifetime. I stayed in LA for a few weeks to recover after the surgery. And on the day before we were to fly back to New York, my surgeon invited Josh, me, and the girls over for a play date and dinner. What crazy, busy surgeon uh, invites one of his patients over to his house? Apparently mine. <laughs> we, we still keep in touch through texts, emails, and phone calls. I remember as we parted that evening and we hugged one another, and I tried to say thank you to this man who had saved my life. But the words wouldn't come. They just seemed so inadequate, and I could only make a feeble gesture like this as I looked into his eyes. I just cried, and I think he cried too. You're going to be fine, he said. And in that moment and the many moments since, I believed him. Wow, Pascal and Julie, you guys are pretty amazing. Um, you know, I will say that I think that we're all part of a, a chain. Um, and I, I think that we're, you know, we're mothers and sisters and, and fathers and lovers and patient advocates and daughters and sons. And I think that we are all going to, at some point, visit the land of ill and hopefully it'll be temporary. Um, but I want to say something about the numbers. Because we hosted uh, Susan Love here uh, recently. And Susan Love, who's a very well-known breast surgeon, um, was diagnosed with leukemia, with AML, which you know has a particularly uh, bad prognosis, and she was in a very strange land because she's a surgeon. You don't treat leukemia with surgery. And she looked at the numbers, Julie, like you looked at the numbers, and she just said, you know, I, I mean, I, I could obsess about the numbers. Um, but we also know that if one person survives with a 10%, uh, you know, s survival rate, it's 100% for that person. Um, and I... I think it's hard to, you know, as a lawyer, as a physician, you know, as a actuary, you know, to, to not wrap yourself around the numbers. Um, but you can't obsess about it. It would just, it would be a frenzy that you'd never get out of. So what I like to think of is, is, the, um, is the dog. Maybe you know about the dog, blind in one eye, uh, missing right ear, broken tail answers to the name of Lucky. And I think, I think that we can find, and we should find hope in every, every single situation, every single situation that we tell a patient, and every single situation that may not have as much hope, we can find something. Sometimes consolation um, and optimism um, is, is really as good as truth. In, in certain instances, and I think that we need to focus on that. We need to focus on narrowing that boundary between physicians and patients because it's a very narrow boundary, as you can see. It's very narrow, and I, I, I hope that we'll find, you know, greater sensitivity 
and a, and a more common ground between patients and physicians. So our next speaker, our next speaker is Alex Niles. <laughs> Alex is a gorgeous hunk. Sorry, I didn't mean to say that. <laughs> I'm like totally embarrassed that I said that because I'm an old lady. Okay, I'm, I'm going to step back here. So Alex was diagnosed with stage four gastric cancer in the fall of 2013 at the age of 30. He's writing a book with the working title of Cancer Playbook um, that is geared towards younger cancer battlers and sets forth his positive activist approach to fighting illness. You can follow him on Twitter, A-L-X-N-I-L-E-S, and Facebook, or on his blog, www.smilesforniles.com. So I, you know, would like to invite you up here to tell us about your um, experience. And, and Julie, could you also give us your blog? Yeah, and I just want to encourage people because the journaling, I think, is so interesting that, and creative writing that, you know, anyone who wants to come to this workshop that we're running. Thank you very much. If I'm blushing, it's not from the speech, it's from that compliment, so I apologize. Um, hey guys, my name is Alex. I'm proud to call myself a stage four cancer survivor. Um, it's interesting when I was invited to speak here, it's one of the first engagements I've had to speak to an audience of somewhat strangers, but obviously there's a lot in common. Hearing what the two previous battlers and, and women shared, there's a lot more in common than I thought. Obviously each cancer is unique, but going through certain things like this, it really does define who you are. I've always lived life by a motto, it's not the situations that define you, it's how you react to them. And hearing what these two women have said before I me, and I'm sure what the person after will, will say, uh, it, it really does kind of set us apart. I mean, I, I feel, uh, even though some might say unlucky, I feel to be the luckiest unlucky person I know. Uh, so first and foremost, thanks to Rachel uh, for coordinating this. Thanks, Dr. Axelrod, uh, NYU. I just saw my two, two people on the oncology team back there, so thank you for them being here. My friends are here. And most importantly, thanks to the strongest person I know, my mom, who is here as well. Um, so yeah, here I am, 31, stage four cancer survivor. Um, never thought I'd be saying those words, but uh, everything happens for a reason, right? About a year ago, I started having pain, much like uh, was said a moment ago in my stomach. Thought it was an ulcer. I recently started a business. Thought it was stress or something along those lines. Never thought it would be cancer, of course. I uh, saw a GI um, sitting in the room with, with my mom and literally thought again that I'd hear it was, it was an ulcer. Well, no, heard the big C. Uh, actually had to make him repeat himself about three times because it was that shocking. Uh, felt like a, a punch to the gut. Very scared, just again, similar to what everyone said. There's no family history. Uh, extremely healthy guy. Went to college on a Division One soccer scholarship. Very, very on, on top of my health and things like that. But similar to what I've learned, um, I believe those who are presented with tests are the ones who can pass them. So although it was a shock at that point, um, I knew that I had what within me what it was to win. After finding out that it was actually stage four, uh, it was last year, September 11th, obviously a date that many people won't forget, but now I have a couple reasons to remember it. Um, I went from having a couple of dates every two weeks to having a date with chemotherapy every two weeks. So it was a little bit of a different uh, routine, you might say, although there was preparation. Um, and, and, and all of a sudden, life changed very quickly. So, you know, didn't, didn't have kids or anything like that. Obviously, I wasn't married if I was dating like that. Um, uh, but for me, it was, it was a challenge because all of a sudden, I went from missing out on friends' 30th birthdays to dealing with fighting for your life. Very, very uh, mixed emotions about it all. Part of me wanted to console those who were trying to console me. But of course, it's, it, it's tough. It's tough at times. So for me, at the end of the day, I really feel as if, uh, as I mentioned before, it's, it's not the situations that define you, it's how you react to them. 
I've viewed it as an extremely positive situation. I've met some incredible people along the way who have inspired me to, to fight on. Uh, likewise, people have said the exact opposite about me and their, and their struggle, whether it be something as serious as cancer um, or, or daily little things like uh, computers crashing at the office. Um, literally, I have a couple stories about that. Trying to put people's pr perspective into place is always interesting. The things that I, I really walk away with, um, I think the topic of numbers are very important. I always was a number guy. My background was, was investment banking on Wall Street. I'm very, very into numbers or very uh, superstitious in regards to numbers. But one thing that I never really focused on at all were the numbers. To me, if people ask me survival rate, it was 100%. There was no doubt in my mind, and I think a lot of people uh, in this, this fortunate category would probably have similar attitudes and similar mentalities. Um, it's tough, I think, to, when you deal with, with, with people in the medical field who deal with so many, so many people battling and, and things like that with numbers, but again, um, my message to them, and, and it's been so easy with, with, with the team who's been helped saving my life, again, two special women in the back there, um, it's always been a relationship. It's not been numbers, it's been about a person. Um, similar to what was mentioned before about being invited places, it, it really, every time I would go into for therapy and even now when I go for checkups and things like that, it's a good feeling. Um, I talk to them as if I'm talking to family, talking to siblings or whatever it is and, and for that I'm grateful. I think another big part that I learned was dedication to nutrition. Um, I'm now a vegan. I never was before. I was the type of guy who would travel the world and eat my way through it. Um, it was probably, you know, if somebody said, what couldn't you live without? I would say both literally and figuratively food. Um, and now, uh, you know, instead of skipping those birthday parties and engagement parties and baby showers and things like that at places like Peter Luger's where everyone's filling their plate with rare red meat, you know, I'm the guy sitting in, in the back with the spinach and the kale green juices. Um, but hey, it's, it's something that I'm grateful that I've learned. Um, I think another big part, uh, something that I walk away with, it, it's, it, it's been a personality change for me. Um, I've been very obsessive over planning, thinking about things uh, way too far out, and I realized that I spent too much of my life planning and not living. Uh, I think anyone who would go through a situation like this would really walk out of it or, or walk through it with the same type of mentality. But for me, it, it's been pretty monumental. Um, I literally would plan everything, and, and now I just try to live in the moment. And I think, again, uh, compared to things that I'm walking away with, having that mentality is something I'm grateful for as well. It's been mentioned before, and, and I think you'll hear from everyone who goes through a situation like this. It, it, even though it, it is unique and, and you kind of are alone, it really is important to have support um, for me at first, I was a proud young guy who had done a lot on my own. I always wore things, wore my heart on my sleeve. I put everything on myself to carry the burden. It was difficult for me to really open up. Even though I do wear my heart on my sleeve, it was, it was difficult to really say to others, especially friends and people my age, how I felt and that, you know, I needed some space or I needed a hug or whatever it was. Um, the support has been absolutely tremendous and I don't, you know, I, I don't know what, life would be like for me if it weren't for that, but I know that I wouldn't want it to be this way without that. And I think, finally, as I kind of conclude here, um, after it's all said and done, I went through 15 rounds of intense chemotherapy, had all the side effects you could imagine. Right now, I'm, I'm taking a, an oral chemotherapy drug uh, twice a day, every day. So I don't really have the chance to not remember it, but I don't think I ever would want to forget it. Because for me, I've, I believe that it's made me a better person. Um, I'm beyond thrilled to say, I actually, the biggest pain I have right now is an itch in my chest because last week I had my medical port removed. And this Saturday I'm flying to California for a week and then Hawaii for a week. And for me, that's something I'm really looking forward to. So that's all. Awesome. Thank you very much. So what do I what do I hear? I what resonates with me here? Well, what resonates with me is the strength and the wisdom of what we've heard. 
Um, and I think that these, these people sound like old souls, but they're not. <laughs> they're young people. And I, I also believe that we are finding with advanced cancers or even stage four cancers that we don't have that nihilistic view anymore about what's going to happen. Um, and I think that is really turning itself on its head in medicine. We have new targeted therapies. Uh, we have new approaches. We have a whole new uh, population of young doctors that are coming through and expecting our patients to live long lives. You know, I remember in the early 80s when we had patients with inflammatory breast cancer, and that's about 3% of the population, they would come um, and their survival was very poor until we started giving, and so we changed around not giving surgery first, but doing the upfront chemotherapy. And that's a paradigm shift for a lot of cancers. So we're understanding that what are people at risk for? They're at risk for dying of cancer that's gone outside of that organ. And we're understanding you know, more about the biology of the cancers. So I'm very hopeful that we're going to have long-term survivors of stage 4 cancers. It has to be. OK, our next speaker is Tony Thomas. Tony from Brooklyn. <laughs> where I was born, that's where I'd like to move back to. Um, Tony is a New Yorker. He's born and raised in Brooklyn. He's a paramedic for Lutheran and Maimonides Medical Center. You love sports. You root for the Yankees. Woo, woo, woo. The Giants and the Nets. OK. There is nothing you can do wrong. Uh, Tony enjoys traveling, just returned from a trip to Aruba. And he's been cancer free for three years. And he's a lung cancer survivor. Come on down. Thank you very much. I'm honored to be here. Thanks to Dr. Axel and Rachel. I'm honored. And I'm so happy for the other people who spoke. They spoke eloquently. And the battle is it's going to be fine. It is going to be good. And I agree with positive attitude. Three, almost well, three and a half years ago, uh, where I work at, at Lutheran, my GI doctor who, you know, when you hit a certain age, I'm the elder statesman out of everybody, so that's okay. You know, you do your endoscopies, you do your colonoscopies and everything else, and everything was good. So she said, I want to do another test. I want to do an abdominal pelvic cat scan with contrast. I said, I've done enough. I said, I don't want to do anymore. So she would go to the paramedic office, where's Tony? See my partner, where's Tony? Tony, where are you? I want you to get this test done. I don't know what was on this lady's mind. So finally, she, she caught me in the hallway. She said, we're doing it now. I said, we can't. I don't have an appointment. So she said, we're doing it now. So we did this abdominal pelvic cat scan with contrast, and she calls me up and she says, Tony, we found a tumor on, the, on your lower left lung. Now, we don't know if there's any more because it only takes a shot of your lower lungs. I said, wow. I said, you know, that was a shock because I never thought I had a tumor. I never felt anything. I, never, I had no coughing, no, no throwing of blood, no pain, no nothing. So we found a, a tumor there. What's interesting is that three months earlier, I had to get a lipoma removed, and they took a chest x-ray and it came up clean. It didn't show up on the chest x-ray. And they claimed that because it wasn't sensitive enough. So she said to me, she says, we have to go further. So the next day, she says, you're going to the pulmonologist. I said, OK, whatever you say. I said, but it's sadly, he's close. He'll be there. He's five-star he's five boarded. I said, OK, no problem. So I couldn't argue with her anymore. So I went to the pulmonologist, and everything went fine. And she, she said everything was good there. So then I had a PET scan. And they saw the one tumor. She said, the only thing is, you can't stay here. I will not lie to stay here. She says, you can't stay here. You have to go to another hospital. So I tried Sloan, and they wouldn't take my insurance. Now, to all these years I've been working and, have, and paying my way, I was surprised they wouldn't take my insurance. I said, and you feel kind of lonely after that. So then one of the other paramedics who had cancer said, Tony, go to NYU. And I met his cardiothoracic surgeon, Dr. Zervos, and, these, and God knew what he was doing. So he said, um, I told him they wouldn't take my insurance. He said, don't worry, whatever they pay, how much they pay, whatever, don't worry about a thing. He said, it didn't look like cancer on the scan, but we can't leave it. He said, but go thank your, uh, your GI doctor. So I did. I went and thanked her. I said, you know, I thank you for finding what you found. And she said, Tony, she says, you believe in God? I said, yes, I do. She says, I want to tell you something. 
She said, I don't save, God saves. And I, I met with her, and I see her quite a lot. And she said, I want to tell you something. She says, I already know that God has you covered. And I never heard a doctor speak like this. And by the grace of God, you're going to be fine. I'm not worried no more. She said, you're going to go through some trials and tribulations, but you're going to be okay. She said, I'm not worried. I already know this. So when I told her Sloan turned me down, but I went to NYU, she said, they're great. And, they're, and it has been a great experience here. This is the best hospital I've ever seen. My the colleges, the surgeon, all the best. So we had the surgery. He didn't know it was cancer. He operated. He said, we're going to do a wedge and a biopsy while I'm at, on the table. And it was cancer. And they removed the left lower lobe of my lung. And it happened to be small cell, which is an aggressive cancer. So he saw all the, uh, the biopsies came out normal. The, the, the borders were normal, except for one lymph node that showed rare cells. I said, that means I have cancer? He says, no, but we're going to for chemotherapy. So I saw my oncologist, who's the greatest guy in the world, Dr. Abraham Shoshua, which all my lung cancer support group meeting people go to. We all go to him. And he, the, I heard everybody else talk about their doctors. You are absolutely right. You're in the best place ever. There is no question in my mind. So I went to him, and I said, they removed the left lobe of my lung. He knew the story. He already knew the story anyway. And he says, uh, we're going for the cure. So I had cisplatin, and I had a top to side. I did it for four months, three days a week, from March to, to June or whatever it was. And it ended up being a stage 1A tumor, which she caught early. If she wasn't persistent with the GI doctor, I would have never found it. So I've been free of cancer for the next three years. I got to go for the scans today, this month. You always get nervous when you have scans. But it has changed my life also, because I realize life is too short. And you have to enjoy what you can. So I'm like you, I travel. I used to didn't travel, now I go. I'm divorced and happy. I go. <laughs> divorced twice, I'm happy. <laughs> so now it's time to go, when I get a chance, my good friend Chris over here works, and we, him and I go, we travel. We go places. He's a nurse here. We, him and I, another couple of batches, we go travel. So we went to Aruba, and Aruba was great. And I'm having the time of my life. And I realize now, and the interesting part of it was, some people said, well, maybe you won't go back to work. Maybe you can't work anymore. I said, I don't see why not. I stayed positive, like everybody else here said. You have to have a positive attitude. Six months later, after everything was done, I went back to work. And you know, being a paramedic is not easy. You gotta run up and down the stairs and carry all the stuff. And to this day, I'm still working. And I hope to retire. I didn't wanna go on permanent disability. I didn't wanna do that. And as Dr. Axelrod said, people are inactive. I try to be active, even though I gain some weight. I, I, I go to Pigalugos, I eat the steak. I'm sorry. <laughs> you too? <laughs> I eat all the food. And when I go away, I, I went to Ruby, I ate everything there too. You know, I try to go as much as I can. I went to Costa Rica in January, went, and I think traveling is great. And I think you have to take care of yourself. And one of the most positive things that happened to me was a lung cancer point group meeting. These ladies and gentlemen back here, they are some of the most, they are, they are, the support that we all give each other there is amazing. And I'm happy it runs once a week, not once a month. Because in case I have to miss a couple because of working, I can always come back. And I always have friends we can always talk to. We talk on the internet, we call each other. They're the greatest. So, the greatest. oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Dorothy. So, I, you know, I'm going to close with that. We have to be positive. We have to thank God every day that we're here, you know. And who knows, tomorrow it might be, it may come back. We don't know. But I know this, it's made me a better clinician out there. I understand more. And I feel compassion more to the people who do have lung cancer, or any kind of cancer. You know, and you understand a little bit better what they're going through. But I realize also it's not a death sentence. And it means that life doesn't go on. We have to go on. We have to move. You know, I had friends who used to would tell me they were, they were thinking that I was going to die. That this was going to be the end. I said, well, I can't be around you because I need positive people around me to think the best with me. I can't be around you. And I stayed away from those people who had negative attitudes and thought that. And I find a lot of people, you know, we, you're right. We all have different cancers, but we're all family. We all have the same things in common. And that's it. We're surviving of a thing. And our lives have changed for the best. And if it wasn't for the care, though, that I got here, it would have been a different story. I think, and I agree with that commercial, the first place you go counts, matters. And I came to the right place the first time. So it was meant for me not to go to Sloan.
And I'm very happy I didn't because they never, NYU never leaves you. They're always here. Like I said, I got my scans, my, the MRI, I hate it on the brain, I hate that. But I gotta do it anyway. I hate that cage around your head, but you do it. So I do the PET and the brain MRI. But at least I don't have to go every three months anymore. I go every six months now, because I passed a two year mark. So I'm very honored to be here to speak, with, to, speak to this audience here. And it humbles me to be in front of people. I'm very proud that you, know, you asked me to do that, I thank you. And all the other survivors here, all of us, we're all gonna be good. We're all family together and we take care of each other. Thank you very much. Thank you.